Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Peter Steves, and it's my privilege to be the director of the DePaul Humanity Center. I'm pleased to welcome you to the second event in our Year of the Fake programming series, as tonight we investigate together shadows. But we first begin, as we always begin at the Humanity Center, by acknowledging the traditional territory upon which we gather this evening. Long before Europeans arrived, varied and numerous native peoples sought to walk gently on this land. They offered assistance to the first European travelers to this territory, sharing their knowledge for survival and living a good life. Among others, the Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Miami, and Illinois inhabited what is now this part of Chicago. While we here today have no power to honor the treaties that were signed, we do recognize that these treaties were brokered under some duress and deception. So it's our hope tonight to honor the good faith with which the native people of the region entered into these treaties. As Potawatomi Chief Matea is purported to have said at the signing of the 1821 Treaty of Chicago, this is a small piece of land. If we give it away, what shall become of us? The great spirit who has provided it for our use allows us to keep it. We should incur his anger if we bartered it away. If we had more land, you should get more. But our land has been wasting away ever since the white people became our neighbors. And now we have hardly enough left to cover the bones of our tribe. In solidarity with Chief Mateo, we recognize the history and legacy of this subjugation, as well as the enduring presence today of Native Americans among our faculty, staff, student body, and community. And it's thus that we seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one based on true respect, as we also reaffirm our general and driving dedication to finding ways both institutionally and personally for the work that we do at the Humanity Center to be a model of what it means to be dedicated to making our society a more enlightened and just place for everyone in our community. So, as I said, this is the year of the fake at the DePaul Humanity Center. And so it seems only fitting to begin this evening by asking whether or not shadows are real. Before we begin our evening in earnest, welcoming an exciting group of scholars and artists, let's take a couple of moments together to try to think this through. And of course, it all depends on what we mean by fake. I am something of an umbrophile, literally a lover of shadows. The word, though, has come to mean a lover of a specific type of shadows, eclipses. But that, too, is something I am. Umbrophiles are known to chase eclipses around the world. 
This is a photo of me taken by my friend Rodney more than 30 years ago at Eclipse Central, which was really just a field in rural Ohio where the two of us took that over for the entire day to set up our telescopes and other scientific equipment to view the eclipse. We've been waiting for it for months, and we shot several rolls of film, remember film, that day, turning many of the results into the height of early 1980s technology, slides to fit in a Kodak carousel to project on a sheet in the basement so we could relive the wonders of that day. Now last summer, my wife and I traveled for several hours to watch the total eclipse in the 100% zone downstate, a trip that was worth every excruciating minute in traffic that barely moved over the course of nine hours following that great event. To stand in the shadow of the moon in a total eclipse, to see with the naked eye, the sun turn into a shimmering black hole in the sky as the moon's shadow plunges you into darkness, nothing quite compares to this. It wasn't until I experienced it for myself that I understood how a total eclipse might elicit over-the-top responses from people at other times, in other places. I didn't exactly want to sacrifice a human, but I came close to understanding why a culture might, upon being in the shadow of something so completely overwhelming. But let me back up again, back to Ohio. But back even before Eclipse Central was founded, Back to second grade in my elementary school that was actually just steps away from that open field where we'd later set up our telescopes. Back to a time just a few days after I had turned seven years old. And my homeroom and English teacher was Mrs. Corr. She was an amazing woman. I'll never be half the educator that Mrs. Corr was. She taught me a lot in terms of what one is supposed to learn in school, but she also helped me learn what it means to be a decent human being as well. It was autumn. I had known her for only a week or two, and I was obsessed with finishing a poem that I was writing all about shadows. Shadows are so very fun, they never run away. The most mm, thing about them is they're almost always gray. So don't laugh at me, I know it's no Emily Dickinson masterpiece. But at least in my mind at the time, it was important to complete it. I wanted to have a sort of darkness at the end of the poem. I wanted to suggest, but then pull away from the idea that there's something sad or even bad about shadows being gray. I wanted to use the word horrible or disappointing. But I knew at least that I needed a two-syllable word to make the rhythm correct. And I couldn't find the right two-syllable word to do the trick. Ugly surely wasn't what I wanted. No shadow could ever be ugly. But the harder I tried, the more the word receded from me. So Mrs. Corr sat with me and talked to me about my poem as if it mattered, as if it were a real poem that could be discussed and analyzed and dissected for its meaning. She talked to me as if I mattered. We talked about shadows, which it turned out she loved too. And that was also the day she taught me how to use a thesaurus a magical dictionary-like book that ended up solving my problem. I'll get back to that in a moment. But for now, let's go back even further in history in search of other more talented shadow lovers. So later tonight, we'll hear from Michael Knox on the topic of Plato's apparent mistrust of shadows. But Philostratus, a Greek sophist, sophist from the second century BCE, argued against Plato and in favor of shadows. His claim was that we can typically know someone's identity simply by looking at his or her silhouette. And we can also have a guess at the person's intelligence and bravery, he claimed. Now, we might not want to push that latter part too much, but shadows do seem to contain a great deal of information. You can probably tell who these people are. Not only can they tell us who the person is, but they're often responsible for our having an experience of a three-dimensional world in general. Shadows, for instance, allow us to see shape. In a lovely children's book of shadow photography from around the same time Rodney and I were looking at the eclipse, authors Ron and Nancy Gore remind us that shadows are not lies. They're not something that gets in the way of our seeing, but instead they're what makes it possible to see the world around us. Look how hard it is to see the shape of the Washington Monument without a side of it in shadows. Or think of the shape of eggs, the way in which shadows give them shape. 
Look at that top egg there, the one with the fake circle. Let me remove it and then wash out the shadows. Note how it basically stops being an egg. Shadows form slopes and curves down which our eyes can move. They create edges and creases behind which our eyes can dart. Shadows and art in general contain a lot of truth. And we can go back even further than the ancient Greeks. 32,000 years ago, artists used shadowing to give the animals volume that they painted on the Chauvet cave walls. Horses round and fill out as their shadowed heads tilt and shake on the stony canvas. These proto-French painters knew that without shadows, the world is a flat cartoon. The world is not the world. As Europe started becoming the Europe that we know today, painting's relationship to shadows grew more complex. Paul Cezanne once said that light, and thus shadows, don't really exist for a painter. The painter, he said, has only paint, not light or lack of light on a palette. But the truth is that when we become painters and attempt to render the world on the canvas, we're exposed to a new ontology of the shadow. To the painter, trying to render everything she sees, a shadow is made of paint, and a vase is made of paint. Constructed of the same substance on the canvas, how are they not the same in terms of their being, their reality? As contemporary watercolor artist Charles Reed declares, cast shadows are as real in paintings as objects or people. Shadows, he wants us to believe, are not ethereal on a canvas, but are as concrete as anything else that's painted. So why must we think of them as ethereal in the world? Fair enough. Yet, even when taken to be real, shadows have tended to carry an air of the trickster about them. In paintings, artists have often used shadows to do things that the subjects in the painting casting the shadow could not do, or are not allowed to do. Consider, for instance, Conrad Witz's 15th century painting, The Adoration of the Magi, and pay special attention to the shadow of the Christ child and his mother. Now, the halos of the baby Jesus and Mary have not cast shadows. Of course they haven't. They're not physical things. They're spiritual markers of importance and divinity. It's important, in fact, for Witz not to paint the shadow of the halos so that we understand what he means. But more interestingly, look carefully at the shadow cast by the Christ child. It differs from his body. The shadow of the Christ child has its own agency. It's accepting the gift of the king. Although the baby's physical hand does not reach out, his shadow hand does, indicating that there's an understanding and a power to the child, even if we cannot yet physically see it. Shadow hands, it turns out, are often up to something. And there's no better example of this, perhaps, than what's taking place in Rembrandt's The Night Watch from 1642. Now, this is an amazing painting of light and shadow in general, of course. But much fuss has especially been made about the errant shadow of the captain's hand. It's not only that it's unclear where the source of light is that's causing this strange shadow to appear, but also that it seems to be a vulgar pun by Rembrandt, with the captain, whose name is Captain Franz Banning Cock, reaching out for the private parts of his lieutenant. Indeed, academia being what it is, Dissertations and entire careers have been built on thinking through this single, strange, molesty shadow. For my money, philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty has the best take on it all, suggesting that we accept Rembrandt at his word, so to speak, get our minds out of the gutter, and let this shadow be a way of creating a third dimensionality for us in an interesting way. Merleau-Ponty explains that the hand pointing out toward us in the Night Watch is truly only there when we see that its shadow presents it simultaneously in profile. The spatiality of the captain lies at the intersection of these two perspectives, which are incompossible and yet together. In other words, we see the hand of the captain to be pointing out of the canvas toward us precisely because we project ourselves onto the vantage point of the unseen source of light casting that shadow, and we note that from that point of view, that hand is pointing at something like a right angle out of the canvas. Merleau-Ponty continues, everyone with eyes has at some time or other witnessed this play of shadows and has been made by it to see things and to space. But it worked in them without them. It dissimulated itself in order to show the thing. 
In order to see the thing, it was necessary to see the play of shadows and light around it. As we move into modern times, the shadow with a will of its own appears in such art as Disney's Peter Pan. Here, a dog's bark causes Peter's shadow to be startled and separated from the boy, ultimately getting discovered by Windy Darling, who stores it in her chest of drawers in order to keep it from getting into more trouble. The next evening, Peter returns with Tinkerbell, and accidentally waking Windy makes friends with her. Windy then sews the shadow back onto Peter's body. So shadows, it's true, have a history of being tricksters, in the visual arts especially, but they're often also associated with doom and death. Shadows and shades are words that the Greeks and Romans used to refer directly to the dead. And at the end of the 19th century, Rodin proposed an architecture of shadows, that's his phrase, be built in our own world above ground in order to commemorate the dead. He went on to create the gates of hell that you're looking at here, and to enlarge the part that's at the top, that massive statue, into a massive statue of its own, entitling it The Three Shadows. But he never embarked on his shadow memorial constructed completely of shadow. It turns out that even something as bland and innocent as a shadow box, a container in which we display knickknacks that hold some sort of importance in our lives, comes from a dark place. Apparently, sailors used to consider it bad luck to have their shadows touch land before they did, especially when returning home. It would be as if their death preceded them, so went the thinking. In order to improve their fate, they created the tradition of keeping boxes containing their metaphorical shadow selves trapped inside, filling the boxes with little items symbolic of their lives, and then storing those boxes on board the ship. The shadows, trapped inside the box, their physical bodies would always touch land first. In English literature and poetry, shadows seldom mean something other than bad news. It's true that in Sylvia Plath's loosely autobiographical 1963 novel, The Bell Jar, she has the character representing her point of view tell us that the most beautiful thing in the world must be shadows. But she goes on in this way. I thought the most beautiful thing in the world must be shadows, the million moving shapes and cul-de-sacs of shadow. There was shadow in bureau drawers and closets and suitcases, and shadow under houses and trees and stones, and shadow at the back of people's eyes and smiles, and shadow miles and miles and miles of it on the night side of the earth. Beautiful words. But we must remember that they are being spoken by a character who is depressed to the point of suicide, and that one month after the novel's publication, Plath stuck her head in an oven and turned herself into a shade for good. In John Donne's poem, A Lecture Upon the Shadow, things aren't much better. Love, we're told, begins in the ignorance of early morning shadows, reaches some clarity at noon when we expect it will now last forever, but then dies out as shadows begin to take it over again until we die. Dunn's poem thus ends, the morning shadows wear away, but these grow longer all the day. But oh, love's day is short if love decay. Love is a growing or full constant light, and his first minute after noon is night. So this is the history that we inherit the history I had inherited back in second grade, the history I was struggling to overcome in some sense as I sat inside with Mrs. Corr, working through the thesaurus as everyone else played outside in the shadowless noon sun. I think now that even in my ill-formed mind, I was trying to come to terms with how to mix light and dark, what it means to be in the shadow of history as well, facing down someone like Emily Dickinson. I'd received that book of poetry for my seventh birthday just a couple of weeks ago by her. I knew I'd never live up to it. And I said ill-formed mind here more as a comment on me in particular, not due to the fact that it was barely seven years old and barely seven years full of thoughts. Seven-year-olds can in general be just as wise or just as foolish as any of us who are seven times older still. It's not about age. No, ill-formed perhaps because I've always been foolishly trying to square some sort of circle, to find a way to sew opposites together to bring meaning to meaninglessness, to bring life to death. That's never changed. Shadows are so very fun. 
They're fun, they're beautiful. They never run away. And when they're missing, it's not their fault that they're missing. They're loyal when the other things of the world are not. And as I learned that day with Mrs. Corr, the most horrid thing about them is their color. Horrid entered my vocabulary the same day that I learned that oxymorons are not necessarily contradictory. Shadows are almost always gray. Not always, but almost always. It's not really a logical problem or a contradiction, I think, because even then, although I had no words to express it, I had some shadowy sense of the manner in which the aporia at the heart of Logos is what makes it possible for us to think and to be. The forever has its limits. Because shadows are precisely what allow us to see in color. Shadows create shape, they create dimensionality, they create the world. They're tricksters with a will that's completely determined and utterly rule-governed, yet, like us, somehow free. We might say that gray shadows are so brilliant that they come in all of the colors of the rainbow. Perhaps, then, shadows are horrid in the way that Melville speaks of the enormity of Moby Dick, or the way that the Book of Hebrews speaks of God as a consuming fire. We fear what is so massive and otherworldly attributing terms of danger and disgust, even in our declarations of secret love and admiration. And it is thus, in our pronouncements of horror, that half of our countenance is necessarily cast in impermanent light, and half is almost always in impermanent shadow. Okay, now on to the main event. We have a nice tradition here, really, of celebrating master puppeteers at the DePaul Humanities Center. Two years ago, for our investigation of Moby Dick, Blair Thomas wowed at everyone, and I'm pleased to say that he's back from the shadow world once again with us tonight. As many of you will know, under Blair's directorship, Red Moon Theater spanned nearly a decade and was a fixture in the Chicago art scene. Today, leading Blair Thomas and company, he continues to push puppeteering into the future often by looking to the past in order to find ways to meld the art of puppetry with poetic, literary, and musical arts across the span of history. Blair's work has won numerous awards and has been celebrated and funded by such groups as the Illinois Art Council, the MacArthur Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Jim Henson Foundation. Tonight, inspired by poet Wallace Stevens and giving us at least 13 ways to think about shadows, I'm pleased to present to you Blair Thomas and the Blackbird.
So we were to have the talented jazz pianist Sean Wallace with us this evening. I'm sorry to say that due to a death in the family, Sean is at the last moment not able to be with us. I just wanted to say that our thoughts and good wishes go out to Sean and his family at this time, and we hope to have him back with us next year. We're very fortunate, though, that Brad McDonald has stepped in to provide tonight's live music for us. Indeed, I'd like to highlight my own personal thanks to Brad for agreeing to this last-minute gig, surely a nightmare for any artist, but one that Brad has confronted with generosity and all goodwill. I'm very much in his debt. Brad, it turns out, was educated as an undergraduate at Elmhurst College and then took his master's in jazz composition right here at DePaul. You can check him out at his website, bradmcdonaldpiano.com, and you should really do that. He's, he's pretty amazing. So, he's gonna perform three shadow theme songs for us tonight at three different points during the evening, and with his first musical performance, please join me in welcoming Brad McDonald. I don't know what I have to follow that. That was nuts. That was really great. All right, well, here we go. Did 
presented by my friend and colleague, Michael Knotts. Michael is professor of philosophy here at DePaul, and um, he specializes in ancient Greek philosophy and contemporary French philosophy. Though we'll get to hear him talk quite a bit about the former tonight, and he's published widely on Plato especially, the majority of Michael's books, and one of which is available for purchase tonight in the foyer, are related to deconstruction and the thought of French philosopher Jacques Derrida. As part of a team with his wife, Pascal Ambro, Michael is one of Derrida's most important translators and was a good friend of Jacques as well until he passed away in 2004. It's impossible to say that Michael stands in Derrida's shadow in any meaningful way, other than perhaps the shadow cast by Derrida's tombstone, a shadow in which so many of us stand now in this unfortunate absence. Michael's work is so original and creative though that it shines by its own light, or at least let it say, that it so thoroughly deconstructs the supposed duality of light and shadow that it makes no sense to use those concepts in a naive way any longer. In a book by Jean-Luc Nancy, translated by Michael, Pascalon, and Sarah Clift, Nancy is thinking about a painting by Rembrandt in which the tomb where Christ was buried is envisioned as a cave. Nancy speaks in words so carefully chosen in English by Michael and his co-translators about the impossible contact of day and night a place where light and shadow interact without touching each other. Could there be such an impossible interaction in Plato's cave as well? We're lucky to have someone as thoughtful and revolutionary as Michael to guide us in such questions tonight. So with his talk entitled Living in Plato's Shadow, I'm pleased to introduce to you the wisest and most trustworthy philosophical spelunker I know, Michael Noss. <laughs> So let me just jump right into the deep end, as it were, of this very obscure and truly abyssal question of shadows in Plato by means of a joke, a philosophical joke that many of you will already know. Having either read it in Don DeLillo's 2005 play, Love Lies Bleeding, or much more likely heard it in David Foster Wallace's famous 2005 graduation speech at Kenyon College. Wallace tells it like this. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning kids, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? <laughs> well, the point of this fish story, Wallace goes on to say, is quote, merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Well, this evening, I would like to suggest that Plato's myth of the cave is, as it is told at the beginning of uh, Book 7 of the Republic, a somewhat, makes a somewhat similar, but even less, uh, less obvious and more complicated point. Namely, as Socrates, the biggest fish in all of Western philosophy will point out, we are living in a cave, in a world of shadows, without knowing it. And worse, and this is for Plato no laughing matter, we, unlike those young fish, think we know what shadows are. The myth of the cave, as we will see, is David Foster Wallace's philosophical joke raised to yet another level, to yet another degree of difficulty, as they say in Olympic diving, to a place where we learn, not just like those young fish, that this is water, which is actually the title of Wallace's dress, but that this is a world, that this world is a shadow world that conceals even from most, uh, most of the big fish the meaning and question of shadows. Now to get to this insight, 
I'm not going to run through all the ways in which the very famous myth of the cave, or as it's called, the allegory of the cave, has been interpreted over the years. I wish instead to follow Plato's lead and ask the famous TST question, the famous what is question, not this time with regard to justice, as in the Republic, or virtue, as in the Mino, but with regard to shadows. What is a shadow? What is it that Plato designates by the word shadow? By the word skia in Greek, so sigma, uh, kappa, uh, iota, alpha. T-S-D-A, skia, is the way Plato would have posed it. Well, as is often the case in Plato, there is both a positive and a negative valence to this term. As something positive, skia can describe as in the Phaedrus, the cool shadows beneath, say, a high tree that gives Socrates and Phaedrus, uh, uh, that, that provide Socrates and Phaedrus respite from the midday sun and afford them the comfort to converse philosophically. In such cases, skia is best understood and probably best translated, not as shadow, but as shade. In such context, then, skia is, best, is a good thing, a shield or a protection. As such, it is not the kind of thing at, what, at which one, one would want to take umbrage. It is, in fact, the protection that makes thinking, even philosophy, possible. It is what protects us from the burning heat of the sun, or, as we will see shortly, from the blinding light of the good. But skia is also, and this is much more frequent in Plato, on the order of 10 to 1. It's much more, uh, much more frequent in Plato for Skia to describe not the salutary work of shade, but the negative, dangerous, sometimes illusory quality of shadows. In this sense, Skia is not something good or redeeming, but something to be denigrated, something, as one might say today, to throw some shade on. It is this latter negative sense that is highlighted in the Republic and particularly in the myth of the cave, which is set up by Socrates in the preceding book of the Republic, when he places shadows, according to what has come to be known as the divided line, at the very bottom of a continuum that runs from things with very little reality, very little being, very little beauty, very little light, and so on, up to things that have much more of these. Socrates there asks us to imagine a line divided in two, one part representing all visible things, the realm of the visible as a whole, and the other all invisible things, things like mathematical concepts and probably ideas like justice and virtue. He then divides each of these in two and says that the visible realm itself has two parts. All the things we perceive or sense, objects of everyday perception, and then the images, the ekona, he says, of those things. Now, by images, by ekona, Socrates says he means, first of all, shadows, skia, and then reflections in water and on surfaces. Hence, shadows belong to the class of images that includes reflections on water or in mirrors, along with, as Plato suggests in another dialogue, all the images that appear to us in dreams. Similar to reflections and dream images then, shadows, the effect or the result of a dark object interrupting the light of a fire or of sun, shadows are but copies, imitations, or semblances of perceived objects. They have no substance to them. They are the fallen, weakened images of perceived objects, comparable, as Plato says, to mere reflections in a mirror, or to dream images, which are but the residue of waking life that somehow have made their way into our sleep. The shadow then, like the reflection or the dream image, comes always second. It follows upon the original, perceived thing, and it is inferior to it, secondary to it, secondary in importance. There can be things without shadows, but there can be shadows without things. A shadow is merely, a shadow thus merely repeats. It merely reproduces or reflects the thing of which it is an image, but with far less reality, truth, color or clarity than the thing itself. Indeed, one could argue that even more than reflections or dream images, shadows are actually defined by their lack of light and color, by their dimness, by their hoary grayness. They do not take place in total darkness, of course, but they are defined by their obscurity, created because of some density 
or opacity, some lack of light or some extinguishing of light. We can make out these images then, but only barely, darkly. And when taken together, they form a kind of skiagraphia, a shadow writing, not a light writing, a photographia, a word that never appears in Plato's corpus, and for good reason, but a skiagraphia, a kind of shadow writing or shadow painting, a sort of trompe l'oeil, a shadow painting that manipulates semblances or imitations and that is characterized throughout the dialogues as, and these are all Plato's terms, slavish, untrue, unhealthy, deceptive, illusory, impure, a kind of witchcraft. We thus get a pretty unequivocal, albeit somewhat perverse answer to the TSD question, the what is question that I said Plato would want to pose. What is a shadow? Well, it is first of all something that is not, or is not completely or fully. It is something that has no real being, only the image, semblance, or simulacrum, sometimes even the illusion of being. In short, a shadow is but a shadow or reflection of being or of reality. A shadow or a reflection that often takes us in and makes us think it is the thing or the object itself. Now, it is with that understanding of the shadow in the background that Socrates recounts in Book 7 of the Republic the myth or the allegory of the cave, probably, undoubtedly, the most famous myth in all of Western philosophy. It has been interpreted as an image of everything from the progression of human life, from birth to death to resurrection, to a political tale of manipulation by politicians and sophists, to an allegory for the media's manipulation of the public through images, the cave being a sort of movie theater, or a living room with a TV set at its center, or today, why not, the World Wide Web with its infinitely fascinating procession of genuine information, right opinion, advertising, and fake news. The myth is told by Socrates as a way to explain the educational path of the future guardians of the state that he has been sketching out in the dialogue. Now, I don't have time this evening to go through all the stages of this allegory. For that, you would need to take my focal point seminar on the Republic, <laughs> Monday and Wednesday, 2.40 to 4.10, in Arts and Letters, 3.10. <laughs> you will remember many of the details. Socrates has his interlocutor, Glaucon, Imagine a cave with prisoners chained to a wall, arms, legs, and neck alike, unable to turn around or to the side, able to look only at the wall in front of them. What they see projected on the wall before them are thus shadows, Plato's word, skia, produced by puppets that are being paraded by some unidentified puppeteers in front of a burning fire, causing the prisoners to think that there is no other reality than that of the shadows in front of them. These prisoners thus live in a world of shadows that is so complete that they don't even know that what they're looking at is shadows. Were someone to come along, the philosophical equivalent of the older fish in that philosophical joke, and ask them, so how are the shadows, kids? How's the cave? The prisoners would no doubt say to one another, what the hell are shadows? What the hell is a cave? But here is where Plato's myth of the cave ups the philosophical ante and becomes a, good more, a bit more complicated than our philosophical joke. Socrates goes on to say that they must now imagine one of the prisoners suddenly, inexplicably, and Plato, the author of the myth, no doubt has Socrates in mind here, suddenly getting free of his chains, turning around, looking at the fire and puppets, and after an initial period of painful adjustment to the light of the fire, finally seeing what has been causing the shadows he had believed his whole life to be the whole of life. He now knows, as it were, the truth of those shadows, namely that they are but shadows cast by the puppets being paraded in front of the fire. But that's not where the story ends. Socrates now imagines the prisoner being forced to climb upwards even further, beyond the fire, until he reaches the opening of the cave itself, where, after another period of painful adjustment, his eyes are able to make out the external, perceivable world. First shadows and reflections in water, and then objects of perception, and finally the night sky, the stars, and then at the very end, and only with a sidelong glance, the sun itself. So notice, in this allegory, there's not just one milieu, one environment, like the water of our philosophical joke, but two, at least two for the moment. There's the world of the cave, 
which is itself divided into the shadows on the wall and the puppets. And there is the world outside the cave, with first shadows and reflections and then objects of perception. There are then, in this myth, two sets of shadows, both called sphia by Plato, two sets which must both be understood as we saw all shadows are to be understood in Plato, namely as mere semblances, simulacra, sometimes even illusions. There are the shadows in the cave, and then there are the shadows above ground on the earth, the shadows of objects and perception. But what then is the relationship between these two levels of shadows? The allegory suggests not just that one set of shadows is juxtaposed with the other, but that one set is actually the image or the shadow of the other. There are the shadows in the world of perception, and then in the cave, the shadows of these shadows. But then, where are we in all of this? Where are we and where is Socrates trying to take us in the myth? Are we just like the little fish being shown the water, in this case the shadows by the big fish? Or are we already like the big fish, who, having lifted his head out of the water into the air, thinks he knows just what water is, or rather in our case, just what shadows are? The question emerges explicitly when Glaucon says to Socrates in the middle of the tale of the cave that Socrates is, is uh, speaking, that is a strange image, Socrates, and very strange prisoners. To which Socrates responds, yes, just like us. In other words, Socrates is saying the joke is on us. Little fish and big fish alike. We are the ones in that cave. Our world, our everyday perceptible world, is or is like the world of shadows, a world in which nothing is fully real. What that then means is that those who have been released from their chains and escaped the cave <clears throat> come not into another higher visible realm of perception, but into a world now of invisible things that are truer, clearer, and better than the visible things of this world, which, as we are now to understand, are but the images, the reflections, or the shadows of those intelligible, invisible things. So what we commonly call shadows are thus really shadows of these shadows, shadows of the visible things that are themselves shadows of purely intelligible, invisible things. Invisible things like the idea of a circle or of a sphere. Invisible things that can be approached or studied by looking at their images, that is, at their shadows, but that in and of themselves are as different from these images as real things are as different from their shadows. In other words, and this is not easy to think and is absolutely impossible to visualize, invisible things somehow cast shadows in the form of visible, perceptible things. And those shadows in the form of visible things are more real than the shadows those visible things cast. So just when we think we know, like Glaucon, what shadows are, just when we think we are more enlightened than the prisoners in the cave, just when we think we can see, like the, old, like the older fish, what they cannot, namely that those things on the wall are shadows, we suddenly find out that visible things, the visible things we've been living with all our lives, are themselves shadows. And what we had previously called shadows are but the shadows of those shadows. The perceptible world is itself a world of light when compared to what we call shadows, but it is a world of shadows when compared to or when seen in the light of the invisible forms to cast those shadows. The perceptible world now is thus itself, in its entirety, a sort of skiographia, a shadow writing or a shadow play that is in some way reflective of the true things that are casting shadows, but that is, for the most part, deceptive and illusory. And the illusion consists not just in the fact that we do not know what shadows are, but in the fact that we think we do. So notice. At two levels of the myth, shadows are created by the blockage of light. The light of the fire in the cave, blocked by the puppets. The light of the sun outside the cave, blocked by material perceptual objects. But at the third level, what we might be tempted to call a metaphorical level, the shadows that are cast by invisible things are the visible things themselves. Visible things that themselves then cast shadows. And what is it, we might then ask, serves as the light source, the invisible light source that somehow 
shines through those invisible things in order to cast shadows in the form of visible things? Well, in the Republic, the suggestion is that the good is that source, the source of all intelligibility and all light in the intelligible realm. Just as, in the, just as the fire in the cave projects shadows of the puppets on the wall, just as the sun outside the cave casts shadows of the things we see, so the good projects or produces through intelligible, invisible things, the shadows we call perceptible things. Which suggests that once we see the good, or at least catch a glimpse of it, we can finally see these perceptual things as shadows, and not as the real things we had previously taken them to be. We can see shadows as shadows, and we can say with Socrates or with Plato, now, this is a shadow. This is a real shadow, if you will. And those shadows that everyone calls shadows, well, they are just shadows of those shadows. Either more shadowy because less real and less clear, or else less shadowy because they are but the shadows of the real shadows. You can see how complicated this quickly gets. <laughs> but also, for Plato, how valuable such a lesson would be. It is the essential lesson, in fact, for anyone leaving the cave, for any and all of Plato's philosopher kings or queens. It is a lesson that might cause one, like the big fish, or like us reading about the big fish, to look down with some amusement at those who do not know what shadows are, those stuck in the cave. But it is also a lesson that might, as Socrates suggests, elicit a certain compassion or pity, and cause those who have left the cave to go back down into it, to be willing, after having seen true justice itself, as Socrates says, to go down back into the cave, quote, to contend about the shadow, the skia of justice, with people who have never seen justice itself. While such a city might not recognize such individuals, while it might even, Plato thinks, put them to death unjustly, Plato's thinking of Socrates, these individuals are the only chance for a city to be, as Socrates says, governed by people, quote, with waking minds and not, as most cities now are, ruled darkly as in a dream by men who fight one another over shadows and wrangle for office as if it were a great thing. Though our world is for the most part a world of shadows and dreams, a world of sleeping minds, Plato believes in the possibility of someone waking up within this dream, someone, some older fish, who is able to lift his head not just above the water into the air, but above the air into the, the, the invisible and eternal and spaceless realm. And this someone, Plato thinks, would be not only more awake, but, and it is with this final characteristic of shadows that I will leave you, more alive than the others. Someone living a life that is truly worth living among those who are hardly alive. Indeed, that's exactly what Socrates says in the Mino, the dialogue in which Socrates is himself actually compared to a fish, namely to a stingray, or rather a torpedo fish. It is at the very end of the Mino, Socrates says that if there were ever a person who was able to discover virtue itself, in other words, the invisible form of virtue itself, that casts a shadow in this world in the form of virtuous men and women, then such a person might be, quote, well, might be said to be among the living what Homer says Tiresias was among the dead. And Plato now cites Homer, quote, he alone has comprehension, the rest of them are but flitting shadows, spia. In other words, he or she would be, quote, on earth with respect to virtue, a real substance among shadows, among spear. Such a person, able to give an account of virtue itself, and not just a mere reflection or shadow of it, would be like the awakened among the sleeping, but also, and even more, like the living among the dead. Hence those who, perhaps like us, live in a world of shadows, those of us who live in the cave are, according to this suggestion, not simply living lives of deception, falsity, obscurity, and illusion. We are, Plato is suggesting, and this really is no joking matter, hardly living at all, or living only a demi-life, a semi-life, a quasi-life, not just a life in the shadows or a shallow life, but little more than the shadow of a life. And I must confess, to conclude,
that I don't know, I, I really don't know, whether this insight of Plato's is the greatest and most promising thing that Plato or any other philosopher has ever offered us, or actually the worst and most dangerous. My suspicion is that it's both at once, the one being the shadow of the other. Great, thank you so much, Michael. What a place to leave us, too. It's a perfect place. Um, so we're out of the cave, and luckily we're met immediately by more music. So uh, we'll bring back, uh, with thanks, Brad McDonald. Uh, I realized I forgot to mention the first song that I did uh, is a Cat Stevens song called Moon Shadow. Uh, and this is a great old jazz standard, uh, The Shadow of Your Smile. Danielle Meyer. 
Danielle is an adjunct instructor here at DePaul, teaching multiple sections of the Liberal Studies class on multiculturalism each year. She's also the artistic director of Aleph World Fusion Dance. Tonight, Danielle will be performing dance from Indonesia, specifically Javanese court dance from Yogyakarta, a court that no longer exists. And it's a dance that's strangely related to shadows and to puppets. There's something uncanny about puppets, especially when they're literally in the hands of an excellent artist, as we all saw tonight. We see in them the movements of a human, we see ourselves in them, but the relationship is actually much more complicated than that. The origin of puppets is hard to trace. Shadow puppets, we know, were popular more than two millennia ago in China during the Han Dynasty, but in many ways they reached their pinnacle in Indonesia. No one knows exactly when they were introduced to the islands. There are records of theater productions of Wayang Kulit, which means, get this, shadow skin in Javanese, telling stories from the Hindu Ramayana more than a thousand years ago, though it's expected that puppets were being produced long before that time even. These shadow puppets, it seems, were being made to look like humans, or at least stylized visions of humans. The joints represented our joints, the limbs bent in the right places, at least two-dimensionally. But history, of course, is always much more complicated, and so is ontology. You're about to see a performance of the Javanese dance Puspurwana. The name means many kinds of flowers, with the music being performed by a Javanese gamelan with the intention of creating a state of various rasas, or moods, in the audience, with each flower representing a different rasa, such as love, compassion, disgust, or amazement. Although the puppets are ancient, this music was composed in the late 1880s, and the dance that you're about to see, this ancient dance, was choreographed only a few decades ago. The sound of the Puspawana that you'll soon hear was actually included on the golden album attached to the Voyager 1 space probe launched in 1977, meant to act as a greeting from the planet Earth to aliens who might encounter the probe someday in the future. Carl Sagan even said it was one of his favorite tracks on the album. But here's the most fascinating thing about the Javanese dance that we're about to witness. The dance seems ancient, but as I've said, it's rather recent, and more than this, the dance was created with Javanese puppets in mind. That is, the dancer is in many respects meant to be moving her body like a puppet, though the puppet was created as an attempt to move like a human. We're back to Michael's shadows of shadows of shadows. Do we thus have something like mimicking the mimicry of something attempting to mimic a human? So indeed, like shadows of shadows, the human dancer's arms bend in strange angles now. Her body is stiff, even when it's flowing. Her face is stoic and expressionless, puppet-like. It is a dance attempting to make the dancer look like a puppet, which was trying to look like a dancer in the first place. And this is but the opening step in a highly choreographed, shady, hermeneutical circle dance. In some sense, neoliberal multiculturalism has meant the death of the court system in Indonesia. And so the dance that has made its way to 2018 tonight across oceans to America, is the shadow of the dance uh, that was performed long ago. But we might as well think about shadows in even more allegorical ways in this performance. The dancer becomes a shadow of the gods in this dance, aspiring to all of the qualities of divinity. Because the gods are said to be so far removed from time, they are said to seem to be slow to our eyes, Hence, you'll see Danielle be incredibly slow most of the time, a movement that is a shadow of a being who is actually said to be moving so quickly that we can't see. Indeed, shadows are at work throughout this piece in countless ways, and it's our good fortune to have Danielle, a truly exceptional artist in and out of the shadows, to lead us in this exploration. One that, as I suggested earlier in Michael's introduction, is at heart an attempt to deconstruct the notion of a shadow on a deep level. Toward that end, we begin with a quotation from a movie in which Danielle finds inspiration in her own art, the masterpiece by the Brothers Quay Institute Benjamenta. Please join me then in welcoming to the stage, Danielle Meyer.
to have a conversation right on this stage with Oscar nominee Michael Shannon. Tonight, our fortune doubles down 
as we welcome Alice Maurice, the associate producer of the 1994 Academy Award winning short documentary film, Defending Our Lives, an investigation of domestic violence that sadly seems as relevant today as it was some 24 years ago. Alice, who will be presenting our second lecture of the evening, is currently Associate Professor of English at the University of Toronto Scarborough and is on the graduate faculty at the Cinema Studies Institute at the University of Toronto. Her terrific book, The Cinema and Its Shadows, which came out from University of Minnesota Press in 2013 and is on sale out in the foyer along with Michaels, focuses on race and technology in early U.S. cinema, exploring how questions of racial difference inform the development of cinematic language in general in the United States a language from which we have yet to break away and which remains woven into the broad structure of what a film is inherently taken to be. It's really a thoughtful and important book and I hope many of you will be able to check it out tonight. With her talk entitled Mere Shadows on a Plain Surface, Believing in Cinema, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Alice Maurice. Beautiful introduction that was. Thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> thank you to Peter and to the Nepal Humanities Center uh, for inviting me to be part of this amazing evening of shadows, which I've enjoyed so, so much. And um, as Peter said, I'm going to be talking to you tonight about the shadow in the history of cinema. So let's get right to it. Make this work. Aha, there it goes. So the cinema has always been uh, intimately connected to shadows. From the very beginning, people recognized the motion picture as a shadow, created when light passes through the image on film and is projected on screen. In the silent era, the relationship between shadows and motion pictures was particularly close. Um, the movies were popularly understood, actually, as dancing shadows, and critics and audiences alike even referred to the cinema back then as the shadow stage. In 1896, Russian writer Maxim Gorky viewed an exhibition of some of the earliest motion pictures projected by the Lumiere brothers' new cinematograph. The exhibition uh, featured movies like the one that's about to appear on screen, which you might recognize as the Lumiere brothers' famous Arrival of a Train. This caused quite a stir in 1895. Uh, there are some stories where people ran screaming uh, at early screenings because the train was headed right at them, but those are mostly mythical. They sound good, but they probably didn't happen. But for his part, Maxim Gorky, uh, after viewing this uh, exhibition of his new technology, said famously, last night I was in the kingdom of shadows. If you only knew how strange it is to be there, it is a world without sound, without color. Everything there, the earth, the trees, the people, the water, and the air, is dipped in monotonous gray. Gray rays of the sun across the gray sky, gray eyes and gray faces, and the leaves of the trees are ashen gray. It is not life, but it's shadow. It is not motion, but it's soundless specter. Now, not everyone was so gloomy about the new medium, um, but I think that Gorky's words are telling. And remind me a little bit of Peter's poem. Oops, getting ahead of ourselves. Um, so, uh, you know, you'll notice, uh, actually, you may have heard a little bit of this before. Usually, uh, when this is quoted, you only hear the very first bit about him being in the kingdom of shadows. And that by itself sounds uh, like something overwhelming and great. But the fuller passage, and indeed the longer review from which it comes, is quite ambivalent and actually more negative than positive and testifies to the uncanniness provoked by this new phenomenon, the moving image. Gorky's comments highlight the new technology's limitations above all. No sound, no color. It is not life, but it's shadow. It is not motion, but it's soundless specter. All of these gray figures suggest death. The shadow and the specter for Gorky are one and the same. So while the idea of the shadow as a kind of haunting presence was of course not born with the cinema, as we've, as we've heard all night. But at the birth of the motion picture, what we see uh, is the idea of the cinema itself as a kind of haunted, ghostly form. The stuff of cinema, its material, the screen image, is immaterial, not there, a present absence. 
audience, if you will. Thus, the name shadow stage, as films do everything that theater does, but rather than live actors, we get, in a sense, their shadows. At these early Lumiere screenings, like the one Borky attended, it's worth noting that the screen at first would show a still image and then would suddenly flicker to life, adding perhaps to that uncanny sense that Borky identifies. In the years that follow, the motion picture strived to become a legitimate art form, with increasing realism and its own specific language apart from the theater or the novel. In that project, defining the cinema's specificity, its uniqueness, becomes key. One commentator writing in 1914, so nearly 20 years after the birth of the motion picture, declared that in cinema a new art form had finally been born, marked by increasingly impressive realism and an increasingly convincing illusion. And yet, that writer also felt compelled to remind his readers and himself that the images on screen were, quote, undeniably mere shadows on a plain surface. So in the early years, the question becomes, do these mere shadows constantly reference all that is missing from the cinema? Realistic color, sound, etc. Or does the screen's image, its shadow, offer a substance unavailable on stage or anywhere else? Now, the affinity between cinema and shadow was perhaps most famously perfected and exploited by the German expressionist filmmakers of the 1920s. These films captured the world's attention because of their striking visual style, featuring very low light compositions and the dramatic use of shadow. Often this was in service of eerie, uncanny stories uh, featuring ghosts, doppelgangers, and vampires, <laughs> like this one, Nosferatu. Um, and it also featured skewed settings that reflected the often unbalanced psychology of the protagonists, with the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, perhaps one of the most famous. Um, and thus the name German Expressionism, the Expressionism being uh, expressing in the external world, the visual world, uh, the internal psychology of the protagonists. Now sometimes uh, shadows would reveal a character's true nature in these films, or the shadows might enact a character's repressed desires, acting as a kind of evil twin. Shadows might equally be associated with essential truths or with dangerous illusions. That is, the shadow might reveal something that the body hides, or it may itself simply be something enticing but not real. And while these films offered a visual catalog for the horror movies and ghost stories that would follow, the, dr the dramatic lighting was picked up by many filmmakers and genres, perhaps most memorably by the American film noir of the 1940s. There's one out of the past from 1947. And there's another one. Stranger on the Third Floor, and this one um, features a very favorite motif of the American film noir, of course, the shadows from the blinds on the window. Here's another a little bit more subtle version of that from Double Indemnity, which features Fred McMurray there in the foreground uh, playing an insurance agent who will uh, plot with his lover uh, to kill her husband. If you haven't seen Double Indemnity, run right out after this and go watch it, <laughs> because it's so good. Um, but here, um, we see the blinds there uh, on his suit, the, the shadows of the blinds. Uh, borrowed from German Expressionism, uh, the shadows here um, represent not uh, an underworld of ghosts, but an underworld of criminality and the coexistence of light and dark within our souls. And so these shadows on Fred McMurray's suit suggest his compromised moral nature while also the striping might perhaps foretell his likely ending as a convict wearing another kind of striped suit. So with this dramatic, while well, this dramatic use of light and shadow is maybe most associated with genres like film noir and German expressionism, cinematographers are always in a sense wrangling shadows. And darkness and extreme use of shadow was characteristic of the most eloquent of black and white cinematography featured in some of the very best films ever made in any genre. Rosebud? I tell you about Rosebud. How much is it worth to you? Thousand dollars? Okay. No doubt you recognize that. That's coming from Citizen Kane and featuring Greg Tolan's stunning cinematography, which pushed the boundaries of black and white cinematography at the time. 
And while this may represent a peak of shadow work in American films, in truth, the cinema discovered its shadow very early on, well before the visual and thematic possibilities reached full flower in expressionism and film noir. Here we have, for example, a little film from 1903 called Silhouette Scene. Though this features a very popular motif of the silhouettes on the window shade, um, and this was used again and again, especially in the very early motion pictures before 1905, uh, when films were typically uh, very short, maybe one or two minutes long, and often unfolded over one shot, typically with a static frame. So uh, by having shadows or silhouettes, um, it sort of created another screen, a screen within the screen, if you will, which provided a way to offer more action within the static frame. And not surprisingly, the scenes typically acted out behind the shade were usually titillating scenes of romance or even more often of women undressing. And those images didn't just provide visual interest in the static frame, they also became ways to stage the film image itself. These little films provide a reflexive commentary on the dancing shadows, which they are. And they also present a portrait of movie going for the audience this woman sort of standing in for us, right, the interested observer, and an already linking movie watching with voyeurism. So by watching what unfolds on the screen, you get to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. Shadows provided a handy way to figure the cinematic signifier itself. But it is true that the cinema truly came into its own as an art form, rather than just a curiosity or a recording of life, um, when it went beyond displaying shadows, to developing a language via shadows. This is from a 1915 film called The Cheat. And this moment right here um, was singled out uh, by reviewers at the time because this scene took place in a jail cell, but the prison bars were never actually shown. They were simply suggested by the shadows of the bars, as you see here. Now, that might not seem very remarkable to us now, but this sort of lighting effect was still relatively new. Remember, this is 1915, so it even predates the German Expressionist films that we were talking about before. And this kind of dramatic lighting uh, was called Lasky lighting at the time, uh, named after the producer of this film uh, and some others, uh, Jesse Lasky. But reviewers also saw in this film the potential of cinema as an art form. And, not coincidentally, the film took full advantage of various kinds of shadow play. Like this, which is sort of a literal shadow, shadow play that happens in the film, as the two main characters there watch a scene unfold on a paper screen, uh, a room divider. So it's not a window shape, but you can see the similarities to the 1903 uh, silhouette scene. So I should note that uh, this film starred uh, Sesu Hayakawa, a uh, Japanese actor who actually his stardom was sort of made with this film, The Cheat, went on to be very successful in Hollywood. Um, uh, and uh, he plays here a Japanese ivory importer uh, and a very stereotypical villain. And his villainy in the film is very much linked to his Japanese-ness, to his being a kind of alien figure uh, in the film. So the film pivoted on a potentially scandalous love affair between his character and that society woman there named Edith. Uh, and in fact, it ends with the near lynching of the Japanese ivory importer. But before that, he attempts to rape Edith and in the process brands her shoulder with a hot branding iron, which is the same way that he marks his ivory. So she marks, he marks her, in other words, as one of his possessions. She then shoots him. And we get this moment here, where his body and shadow uh, occupy the screen at the same time. We can see there his, uh, his arm at the bottom of the frame there poking out uh, of the paper screen. There's a rip there. And then we see above the blood that stains the screen, his blood. And his shadow is kind of pitched in between his blood and his, his arm. was anchored by its use of shadows. Uh, but I think equally important is the film's shadows were solidified or given substance, in a sense, by the film's exploitation of race. It was a powerful combination in 1915. 1915 is an important year in the history of film because it marks the beginning of the feature film era. And it's also the same year that D.W. Griffith's racist epic, Birth of a Nation, came out. 
That film was a landmark in filmmaking and in white supremacist propaganda as it was a celebration of the Ku Klux Klan. But both Birth of a Nation and The Cheat featured racist ideology and the exploitation of race for not just emotional but for visual impact. And The Cheat, a film that pivots on racially charged situations, also plays with surfaces, with shadows, with screens, with skin, and seems to want to bring the body and the shadow together. The Orientalism of the piece, in other words, depends on this play between body and shadow, screen and skin, flesh and blood. Predating the German Expressionists, the film offers an American shadow play, shot through with racially charged meaning. And at the same time, the film's shadows announced that cinema had arrived as a, legi as a legitimate art form. So I want to jump forward a little bit. Um, we've been talking uh, and looking at silent cinema and black and white cinema, um, and that makes sense because obviously the shadow would be naturally uh, more prominent in black and white cinematography. Uh, and, in si and also because in silent cinema, the shadow is particularly eloquent. The shadow speaks in those films, even if the people jump. Um, and in a way, the shadow uh, can be both very legible in those early films uh, and also at the same time elusive, offering a kind of ambiguity that uh, is important for any art form. But the shadow actually retains its privileged position in, in the definition of the cinematic, even with the coming of sound, of color, of 3D, and in our own time, with the replacement of the film image with the digital image. The death of film, long foretold, of course, has come. Nowadays, a large percentage of Hollywood films are shot digitally rather than on 35 millimeter film, the standard for decades. So, keeping everything we've <laughs> seen and talked about tonight uh, in mind, I want to show, uh, show you a clip from a 2011 film called Tattoo. Tattoo, shot on the new epic camera on a 40-foot screen, 
The only thing I could think was that this looked like it was shot on 65 millimeter film or with an IMAX camera. There was no visible grain or noise with beautiful shadow and highlight detail. And then he goes on to say that he's going to shoot his next film with that camera. So he's commenting here on two things. The ability of the camera to shoot in low light, dark compositions, because that's what he means by no visible grain, because if you shoot with low light, usually it's a grainy picture. Um, and he's talking about the camera's ability to deliver beautiful shadows. That is what convinced people who worked with film their whole lives that digital could in fact be cinematic. <clears throat> and this is a shot from the end of the film. That's the tattoo of the title. Once it's been finished, it's a red dragon. I don't know if you can see it very well, but that's what it is. And so, again, I just wanted to show the way that the shadows are striking his skin here. Again, the shadows of the blinds. Uh, and the way we see this combination of shadow with a mark on the body. This is the camera saying, look how nice the skin looks. Look how nice the shadows look. Look how you can put them together. And again, not coincidentally though, uh, the film draws on ethnic stereotyping and racialized identity with an orientalist sense of mystery associated here with the Chinatown setting and with the red dragon tattoo, which is touted in the film as having a mystical power. So even in this promotional film, it seems, dabbling in stereotypes, seems to seal the deal, to marry body and shadow, magic and realism, to give the shadow a little extra meaning. So the shadow, as we've seen, has been inextricably linked to cinema from the beginning, and it still defines the cinematic today, perhaps because it references both the cinema's power and its limitations. It still flits between presence and absence, between the cinema's unique powers of realism and its immaterial spectral image. In our current moment, the cinema is digital. It's gigantic, it's spectacular, it's full of special effects, computer-generated imagery, it's seemingly limitless. And yet, the simple shadow seems to retain its power. And now I'm gonna show you the opening of the 2007 Oscars ceremony. March of the Penguins, 2007. <laughs> so, uh, it's as if um, in the age of the digital, as the digital takes over and films get more and more real, the industry feels the need to get back to the basics, to light and shadow, to represent the cinema's magic, but not with cinema, but with shadow. Using the proto-cinematic shadow play to represent the cinema because the shadow offers us a connection. We can all still make shadow animals, right? On the wall, right? It's a connection to us and also a con connection to the body. But it's also a symbolic matrix that takes the body and raises it to a monumental cinematic icon. So I want to conclude with something from Antonin Artaud, who was an actor, a playwright, a theater director, a poet, and all around a uh, genius provocateur. Writing about theater in the 1930s, he said this, every real effigy has a shadow which is its double, and art must falter and fail from the moment the sculptor believes he has liberated the kind of shadow whose very existence will destroy his repose. What does that mean? He's a poet. Um, but you know, he was talking about the theater, but also by extension, all art which he saw as being in the business of destroying shadows and creating them anew. The artist, however, doesn't control the shadow, and to think so would be a mistake. For Artaud, the shadow is a kind of life force, if you will, the essential form that ironically escapes and unmakes all forms. And so it is with cinema. The shadow is its substance, its symbolic nexus, and potentially its undoing. A sign of everything it is, 
and everything it lacks. Perhaps that's why American cinema has occasionally tried to embody the shadow by interlacing it with racial stereotypes and racialized imagery. But that has only made clearer the ambivalence at its heart. The shadow, the cinema's double, its precursor, is the simple, dangerous essence at the heart of its power. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. So to close us out tonight, uh, with one last shadowy song, we welcome Brad, Brad McDonald. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this is a song that was originally written uh, by, uh, and performed by Al Jolson, but made famous uh, by Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. This is Me and My Shadow. as well. So I'm going to ask all of our presenters to come up on stage. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the origin of the Blackbird and how it was that Wallace Stevens inspired you to do something shadowy like that? Um, sure, yes. Uh, well, I'm principally a puppeteer and um, 
Uh, I had a couple different, I had three different streams going in my mind and inspiration. One was that poem for a long time, felt very evocative. It's a, it's a, it's a very accessible poem. And, um, and the idea of doing a multiple scroll piece was something I'd never done before. I thought this was awesome. like, I just want to match that one. I have four scroll pieces. And then I also felt like another stream was going, was uh, I'd like to do a piece with the Ben Johnson string quartet. And so those things, th there's always things like that there early, and they didn't seem to be connected. And then, um, and then I, uh, uh, just, I just started to leave that, I don't know, there was an instinct to put them together. And um, I was, uh, I was interested in trying to uh, capture something that's elusive about the poem, because there's something elusive about it. There's something like, um, um, it's sort of in between all the spaces of the words. And, and, um, uh, and I was thinking that the, that the music it is a similar accessible way. It's like using the popular melody of Amazing Grace, but then and Johnson's a microtonal composer. He's taking it apart, and it, he, you hear it about about you know seven or eight times in the course of, of the piece, but it's, it's very dissonant, so it's, it's a similar kind of thing that's interesting to me. So, um, uh, so it's like in, in the puppet theater, it's a popular start form, and so there's a, you have to have something that sort of uh, people can latch onto, sort of. And so, um, um, and then I just devise a narrative of it. There's a, what's a, there's a narrative in this poem? It doesn't have a narrative. There's never, no narrative in that poem. But I made a visual narrative, and then I got all off on the excitement of like high and powerful panels can make a different narrative. And, um, uh, and that was, uh, yeah, that's, uh, the, I, I left off a couple of the verses that you noticed that were, there was a change. Mm -hmm. um, because it didn't fit my visual narrative, you know, so I had this, and so I came up with a very simplistic, you know, story of, of uh, I was interested in this, uh, uh, this uh, Buddhist concept of, of uh, how uh, uh, doubt uh, erodes a uh, 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 relationship. And, um, and so then, uh, having done several different kinds of shadow puppet pieces, but have been very influenced by the Japanese Wayong in its theory, but uh, not really knowing how that kind of practice, which is so cultural, can have uh, an application in Western theater, the public theater, and here in Chicago. And, um, so what I'm also borrowing from the, the Japanese uh, kabuki theater uh, screen, and uh, with the woodblock, uh, it's actually uh, it was, uh, uh, a, a, a meditation device that's used. Uh, the, the woodblock in, in Korean Zen is a, uh, uh, the, the sound of the woodblock should uh, um, uh, awaken the Buddha nature in the listener. And so, um, uh, so I was combining that with the idea that there is, uh, there is in a sense, a, a, uh, the piece becoming a parable. And so I was hoping that all these things would conspire. <laughs> like we have the sort of Western theme of Amazing Grace, but then it's actually kind of uh, dissipated in some sort of way with these uh, some splats, uh, some of the traditions of uh, Asian theater uh, employed with this um, this sort of more cinematic view of uh, using scrolls in the way that even the panels can can mix and confuse our and engage us in a way that I think the Indonesian shadow theater uh, pre cinema world created seems flat and doesn't engage our cinematic eye. And so I was trying to get all those, marshal those things at once towards the, the single notion of, of, uh, of, of this, uh, this indescribable moment that's in the hole somewhere. So that's what it was. It's really interesting, it's beautiful, thank you. One of the things that stuck out to me was the, the weird way in which narrative came into play throughout the entire evening. So as you say, that poem is not especially a narrative sort of poem, but you did create a story around it. And of course, every little song is a tiny little story, right? It doesn't necessarily go someplace, but different things are happening. Michael telling us 
a, a very condensed kind of story. It's an allegory, which is the, perhaps the simplest form of a narrative that there is. And then so much comes from that in Western culture. Alice showing us that from these initial, just scant narratives, a train is coming. Right? That you can weave this narrative of, guess what? There's all of this race and stuff that's built into it as well. And Danielle, um, maybe Danielle, you could answer this question because it seems like the dance doesn't have a traditional narrative either. It's not like, I'm gonna go over here and put some flowers there and then this is gonna happen. But yet, it is supposed to take us on a particular journey. We're supposed to be different after we're done seeing it. When you dance it, are you thinking in terms of narrativity at all? No, I'm thinking of what to do next. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, it's just like, it's creating the mood. I think that's the most important thing of being calm. And that's really what Japanese dance is in general. So that's far more important. There really isn't even a story. So I don't think there needs to be, you don't have to put a story on top of it if that's not what's there. Yeah. Right. We've talked about this for, before on this stage in years past of how Western dance seems to be very based on, look at me, look what I can do. But this kind of dance is kind of the opposite of that, right? It's look inward in some sense, and you might even be bored by this. I, I'm but a then, dancer, but I don't like that kind of dancing. I, mean, yeah. it's, I don't have anything to say in this medium. Like, I'm a teacher, and I have things to say in other, in other mediums in my life, but when I dance, it's not about me. Like, I don't feel like I need to put myself into it. And so I like these kinds of dances that are about other things, and that help me, too. You know, it's very meditative, and. I think very beautiful, so. so. So not a story, but it does lead somewhere, maybe to a kind of enlightenment out of the cave as well, right? I would invite you then to stay around for a few minutes if you have some questions you want to ask more privately to all of our guests. It's a really great evening, really happy to have all of you here. Will you join in thanking once again Brad and Michael and Alice and Danielle and Blair and also Nina for doing the great <laughs>